Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so this is the Wednesday news segment. I don't normally do this live. I did it last once. I normally I've only done it once so far. Uh, I introduced the Wednesday news segment last week. It got a good response, so I thought I would you know, keep doing it. Uh, I found out today, though, the problem with doing a news segment on sciencey stuff is sciencey stuff changes per day. So uh, I woke up this morning, and the story that I was going to do, the, literally the first thing that I read when I woke up this morning, uh, completely obliterated what I was going to do for my Wednesday news. So I decided to just kind of do this live. I'm not really the best at live streaming, but I'll, I'll do I'll do what I can. Um, but you guys can watch this, and if you and if you like the the live uh, interpretation of Wednesday news, then uh, we might do some more of that. So. Um, the deal is, I, uh, I, uh, the deal is, I'm going to be plowing through these really quickly. Um, I don't want to do a big long live stream like I've done in the past. These are meant to be really short. So um, I've got a few stories that I want to kind of talk about first before I get to the big story, which is clearly why most of you are here. You read it in the title. Um, so first story, and I'm going to show the screen here. Uh, again, I'm just going to plow through these. If you want to get the details, you can go down in the description. I've got links to all these down there. So, story number one, tractor beams. Don't we love it when sci-fi stuff starts to come to life in real life? Isn't that so cool? Well, some researchers have come up with an acoustic tractor beam that can suspend things in the air. Let me go to the screen here for you. This is in CNET. There we go. And uh, yeah, I love their title. Tractor Beam Breakthrough Could Lead to Levitating Humans. Uh, I, don't think I don't think they're quite there yet. But it's an interesting concept. What they call it is an acoustic tornado. Um, so you got a little piece of star. Actually, there's a video here I can show you. Um, there you go. So yeah, you got the little uh, piece of styrofoam that floats in the acoustic tornado, as they call it. Acoustic vortices that traps particles in the midair there and does all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so this is interesting. You know, we see in the movies, uh, tractor beams are usually something that you see in sci-fi and uh, space. Obviously, acoustic stuff would not work in space. But, um, I don't know, maybe there's a similar kind of thing that could be done with light that could be done in space. I don't know. That's, that's pretty far-fetched. But, uh, interesting concept, interesting stuff links downstairs if you want to check that out. The next one, there has been a new blood test that has been created. Uh, this is story number two. I need graphics out for something like that, but I don't have them yet. Story number two uh, is that there is a new blood test for screening for cancer. It's called, once well, this is from NPR, I'll share the screen. Um, it is called, what is it? Cancer Seek is what they call it. And um, it basically helps to find uh, DNA from tumors and stuff like that. So the big thing with um, cancer, let me go back to my camera here. The big thing with cancer is we're getting a lot better at treating it, but it's still the biggest factor in whether or not somebody survives cancer is how early it's detected. And with a lot of cancers, um, especially things like pancreatic cancer, uh, sometimes liver cancer, by the time any symptoms show, it's kind of too late. And so being able to get some kind of early detection through a blood test would be really amazing. And there's been a few that have been coming out recently, but this is a new one. Um, it's, it uh, checks for eight different major cancers, lung, breast, colon, pancreas, liver, stomach, ovary, and esophagus cancers. And obviously uh, pancreas is the one that I always think, pancreatic scan cancer scares the crap out of me because literally by the time you find it, it's kind of too late. But um, these are all uh, the types of cancers that you probably wouldn't know until you're already symptomatic. So um, this is a good thing. It's only working in about, let's see, what does it say? Um, okay, so they did a test on people who already have cancer, and it was positive. It worked in about 70% of cases, which is pretty good odds. Um, it, it did not have any false positives, but it did not get everybody that actually had it. So they're talking about it. it's uh, it's an interesting debate that's in this article. It's worth checking out. Again, it's down in the description. But it, it's talking about how um, false positives are bad, obviously, but false negatives are um, just as bad because if you go 
to the doctor and you get a test done and it says that you're not uh, cancerous and it turns out that you do have it, clearly that's a bad thing. Anyway, uh, it's an interesting article. You can check it out. There's, there's also one that um, I'd heard about a long time ago, and I don't know why I've not heard more about it recently, that focused on microRNA. And, um, and it was supposed to be able to treat, or not treat, but uh, predict all different kinds of cancers, like way in the early stages of it. Um, I don't know why we haven't seen more of that. It's been really frustrating for me. Anyway, moving on. Uh, story number three. Three is, uh, so <laughs> you all remember a few years ago, the whole hullabaloo over Pluto. They redefined a planet, what a planet is, and Pluto got kicked out of our definition of a planet. Well, they're talking about maybe having to redefine what a planet is again. Let me share the screen here. This is from Gizmodo. And this time it's not about how small a planet is, but how big a planet is. Because above a certain size, um, they say that Jupiter, uh, you have to be like 13 times bigger than Jupiter to actually become a star. But there's these, um, there are these planets that are in between Jupiter and star-sized, and they're saying that this might be a different class of uh, planet because they literally form differently than other types of planets. Um, so it's, it's a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting article. And, um, and they talk about how some of these are not even like in solar systems, they're just kind of like rogue planets floating around, but they shouldn't maybe even be um, categorized as planets because they actually formed as stars that just never quite ignited. So it's, it's an interesting, interesting take on it. Anyway, link downstairs. Uh, story number four. Speaking of planets, um, TRAPPIST-1, the TRAPPIST-1 system, I've talked about that one in an exoplanet video way back when. And uh, we've been keeping our eye on it for a while, and they're doing more and more tests. They're keeping, um, you know, they're, they're, it, it, it's a very likely candidate for habitability and for life to have formed. There were a lot of things that they thought maybe weren't going to be very um, likely for it because a lot of these planets were probably tidally locked because they're so close to the sun, to their star. But uh, new tests, it looks like, by the Planetary Science Institute, as reported in phys.org, let me share that screen, says that uh, at least two of the planets could possibly be very uh, likely habitable. One of them, uh, they're, they're ranked in uh, order from B through H. And I think it's D, where does it say this? Uh, yeah, planet D is thought to have a global water ocean covering it, as I have highlighted there, um, which is fantastic. I mean, uh, really interesting stuff there. I, I do get a little bit, whenever I hear about exoplanets and stars that are like 10 light years away, it's interesting, it's cool. Uh, we will not be getting there anywhere near in our lifetimes, is the only thing, unless we develop some kind of Alcubierre drive, we're not getting anywhere close. So that's, that's kind of a bummer, but it's still, it's still interesting stuff. But none of that is why you're here. None of that is what you want to hear about. What you want to hear about is the Falcon Heavy finally getting its static fire test. And um, this was the thing that blew me or that, that threw me off this morning. I, I, I was going to do a story about how the government shutdown was going to cause further delays to the Falcon Heavy. We've already had many, many, many delays. And not all of it is SpaceX's fault. Um, and even if it was SpaceX's fault, they're being cautious, as they should be. There's nothing wrong with that. This is a, a new system, and they've got to make sure it works and everything. I don't fault them for that one bit. But um, there have been a lot of delays. They were talking about the end of last year, and then they were saying the end of January they were going to do it. And, um, and then the Zuma thing happened. And you know, a little update on that, by the way. This is good for SpaceX. They, they seem to be coming out in the clear on the Zuma mission because um, the Air Force has apparently um, put out a statement or basically reaffirmed that they're going to continue working with SpaceX, which basically means that they don't blame SpaceX for what happens. Normally, I talked in my uh, video last week about this. This was my Wednesday video last week. Um, normally, SpaceX provides the payload adapter, and Northrop Grumman insisted this time to use the payload adapter. So... Again, uh, you know, if you want to go down conspiracy row, it you, you know, look like I said last week. If it's if it's a spy satellite 
who knows? It, it, I mean, it's, it could be out there. It might not be out there. But bottom line is uh, Northrop Grumman created or built the uh, payload adapter that normally SpaceX does. So if something went wrong, it's pretty much all in Northrop Grumman's department right now. So SpaceX is, seems to be in the clear on Zuma, which is good. So that was a little diversion. Anyway, um, so with all this stuff going on, the, the static fire, the test, the, the, the launch has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Well, uh, I woke up this morning and I was going to do a story about how the government shut down, was going to push it back even further because the Air Force has to be involved to you know, navigate the skies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I get on the thing this morning and I look and it turns out they're going to do the static fire today. Of course they were. And they did. They pulled it off um, right around noon my time, which would be about one o'clock. No, no, it was a... Uh, Anyway, a couple hours ago. This literally just happened, which is why I'm doing a live stream today. Uh, so let me share the screen. There's a few pictures I can show in a video. Um, so this is from Spaceflight Now. Um, these guys actually do some really cool stuff. They're all about keeping track of Spaceflight. Um, they did live stream this, but you had to be a member, which, by the way, it's 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 totally a cool thing to be a member of it. Um, so yeah, Elon tweeted out that it held down its firing this morning was good, uh, generated quite a thunderhead of steam, launching in a week or so. So that's, that's the big news. Um, he's now saying that in about a week, the Falcon Heavy is going to launch. And this is, this is, I can't wait for that. I, I, if I can live stream it, if I can possibly work out a live stream situation, I will, I will do it and share it with you guys. And we can all get in a live chat and have some fun. It'll be really cool. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I do have a video of the, of the launch date. There's not much to see. It only fired for about 10 seconds, and it's like off in the distance. We may have some clearer imagery coming. I can't, I can't imagine that SpaceX doesn't have some great footage out there in the next day or so. But let me show you what we have here. Uh, is it this one? Here we go. <laughs> this, is, this is a 41-minute video that I moved uh, up to where this happens. So... Um, Give it just a second. You'll see a big, huge cloud of smoke coming off this bad boy. Any minute now. Here we go. There we go. Pretty cool. Yeah, so they only fired it for about 10 seconds, and, um, and that's it. You just see a cloud of smoke. So um, the way they do this, as I read anyway, is that they actually, they do what they call a wet fire or a wet test where they, they load up the, the fuel and get it all ready so it's like ready to launch. And they're basically testing the structural integrity of the tanks and everything uh, just to make sure it's all holding together and whatnot. And then, um, and then they actually did the, the test for, for 10 seconds. And it looks like everything worked according to plan, which is awesome. And um, they should be launching next week. And I'm super excited about it. Um, again, hopefully there'll be some newer, um, cooler video coming out soon. That was just kind of like a little taste right there. But I wanted to share also, there's a few little nuggets of info I heard about the, um, let me see if I can find it. Some nuggets of info about what they're going to be doing on the uh, on the launch, in terms of uh, some more fun stuff that they're going to be adding in here. Um, Seeing it. Well, anyway, so that you know, he was talking about launching his Tesla Roadster, his original Tesla Roadster up there. It's going to be playing Space Odyssey. God, I keep saying it like that. Space Oddity, <laughs> David Bowie. And uh, it's also going to have some stuff from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's going to have a towel so it won't panic. And, uh, and some other things. I, I couldn't find it just now, but it may be in the link that I put downstairs. Anyway, so um, that's big news, and it's exciting. Um, the fact that they were able to do it so quickly after the shutdown um, means that they were really ready to go. And it's on the pad. And uh, barring any other delays which there have been many so there, there might be a delay but uh we're looking at sometime next week i can't wait to find out when and i'll be sharing it with you in any way that i can but uh 
Anyway, those are the news stories I wanted to share. I would love to hear in the comments what you guys think about it, about these stories, whether they're interesting to you or not. Um, I am still debating how I'm going to be doing this whole Wednesday news thing where I'm going to focus on one story or, you know, kind of present a few different things because basically throughout the week as I go through and I hear things, I'm like, that's cool. And I just kind of put it over and I will share it with you guys here. But um, hopefully next time they won't throw me for a loop first thing in the morning by completely throwing out the window the thing that I was going to talk about. Thanks, science. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to keep this one short and um, let you guys get on with your day. And um, I appreciate you guys for watching. There's actually 700 people watching this right now. Well, wow, that's, that's way more than I've had in the past. Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, I haven't done a live stream in a while. My audience has grown. But thank you guys so much uh, for joining. And, um, and I'm sorry I don't really have time to go through and, and respond to questions and stuff like that, but maybe next time. Uh, but you guys enjoy. Have a great rest of your week. I have a video coming out tomorrow for Random Thursday and obviously Monday and other things. So you guys take care. Thanks for watching. See you later.